Okay, when we recorded this, we did not know what the weather was going to be. And so this could be live, or you could be watching this online. You could be watching this a lot of different ways. It could be snow outside. It could be sunshine. It could be rain. It could be a lot of different things. But I want to just bring you up to speed on a couple of things that will be taking place. Next Sunday, which is Valentine's Day, we want you to declare your love. We'd like for you to make a little video. It could be a snapshot of your card that you send to your sweetheart. You could make chocolate for them. A lot of different things you could do. But we would like to have a record of that, and uh, we would like to post those things online. So get those in to me this week and keep that, uh, keep that in mind. Also, next Sunday morning, Pastor Greg will be here with us. And after the service, just for a few moments, Pastor Greg will be sharing with us a couple of things. And so if you're a board member, we want you to be, here, be sure and be here for that as well. Also... We have a baby dedication next Sunday, and if you have a child that you would like to have christened, uh, we would love for you to participate in this with us, and we will be doing that. You would need to let me know that this week through email, which is kendupin at gmail.com, or you simply need to call me at 540-293-3500 and uh, we'll set it up that way. But we would love if we could uh, christen your child and uh, take part in that sacrament as well. Now, you're probably wondering what this number that I'm holding up here in front of me is. It is how to text giving, and I just thought I would hold it up there to you because we need for you to text and give. Uh, not just a little, we need for you to text and give a lot because, um, as you know, when out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. And uh, so we're putting this in your mind so that you can text and give to, uh, to the church. Sincerely, honestly, we need this. We need your support. And we need you to make a commitment to uh, continue us through this very, very difficult time. Strangely enough, the expenses of a church don't go away uh, because uh, there's not a congregation that meets, because there are not activities that continue on. The obligations of a church, we just had to pay our social security taxes as a church. We just had to pay our insurance. Our utilities run $600, $700 a month, even if the place is empty. So you see, that's, uh, that's quite a bit. And so keep that in mind, and we want you to text and give. And uh, we do this broadcast, uh, and now it's very expensive, the type of internet that it takes to make this where the mouth goes with what you're saying is uh, a lot more money than what we started with. And that's why we need for you to support uh, our giving in many ways. I love my wife. I love her, I love her, I love her. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's a beautiful woman. I mean, she is gorgeous. Uh -huh. And she's smart. I mean, I'm not just talking like Copernicus smart. I'm talking like, she's like Einstein smart. Yeah. And uh, I am probably one of the most blessed men on this earth because of her, because of that lady. I am, I am truly blessed. Yep. Hear me world, I am married to the most gorgeous girl on this great planet that God ever made and I love her, I love her, I love her. So have you told her lately? Huh? Your wife, have you told her lately? Uh, hello, have you not been listening to a single word I've been saying? Yeah, I haven't told her. She knows. How? Uh... I let her marry me, didn't I? What a lucky lady she is. Tell me about it. This morning, I'm not going to preach at you. I just want to share with you just some uh, things, particular with this being 
February, which is Valentine's Month, and think about what it is to be in love and what it is to be in love in this culture. There are a couple of things in, um, in the society in which we live, and when I say that, I'm talking about in a community of Christian evangelicals that I'm not sure where we get these ideas, but we get them. And one of them is on the second coming. I'm not always sure where we get our ideas on the second coming. And the other day I had somebody ask me if I believed in rapture, and I said, listen, I think rapture is a great idea. I think it's a great idea. And I said, I hope that happens. But I said, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where that is. As wonderful an idea as I think it is. And I think oftentimes we... uh, when we don't have specifics to work with, we sort of make up the rest. And I think the second coming is probably the one issue that is most like that. When Jesus talks about the second coming, he says, when you see these signs, he says, these are like labor pains of my coming, of the second coming. And I think every generation since Christ has felt those labor pains, each generation, now for 2,000 years. And I think that's intentional so that we're always ready for the moment that he chooses to do that. But most of the stuff I hear on the second coming, uh, it's just, um, they're great ideas, sounds good, fantastic, but I don't see most of it anywhere in Scripture. Be ready. Any time, any moment, he can come back. The other one is teaching on marriage. And when you look at Scripture and what it honestly says about being married, there is not a lot, not nearly as much as I wish there was and not nearly as much as I think we as pastors and teachers and preachers probably come up with. As I look at the Old Testament, I cannot find a single couple there that uh, I want to pattern my life after in contemporary society. Now, maybe that time was different and therefore the expectations were different, but I don't see a good model. And as close as I come of the couple that we've been studying, and that's Sarah and Abraham, we're going to talk about them in just a minute. And when I look at the New Testament, the people that give us the teaching on being married, neither one of them were married. Jesus teaches us about marriage, and he wasn't married. And of course, the Apostle Paul teaches us about being married, and as far as we know, he was not married. So somehow the ability to extrapolate from that and say this is how he intends for us to live today is difficult. And I just want to say that up front. In fact, many of the people that write all of the books and do the seminars and the tapes and the retreats and the great sermons, they don't make it either. So I just want to say that this is not, it's not easy. And yet, it defines our life. It is something that defines our life in such a way it can determine whether or not this journey is enjoyable or it's miserable. It determines that. And yet, Scripture gives us very little specifics on how to do that, which means it comes under much broader categories. And so we're going to look at that in just a moment. One of the things that makes this very difficult for us as Americans is that we have a template, a cultural template, honestly, that is different than the rest of the world. We truly do. And that template is only about 100 years old, and for thousands and thousands of years, there was a single template on how it was that we chose a mate, got married, and then lived our lives. For thousands of years, there was a template for what we think of as our culture. 
And that's how they did it. And about 100 years ago, that changed, and we shifted to what we call today romantic relationships, where people date two or three people and find one that they fall in love with, and eventually they marry that person. That model is about 100 years old. It's not very old. In fact, the story of Romeo and Juliet is, is unique in the sense that it is a romantic story. And never before had that, had that happened. And so it's fast, the story of Cinderella. It's a fascinating story. They are fairy tales because that isn't how it was. It all changed about 100 years ago. And strangely enough, it changed from this intense template to virtually no template. None. I mean, we just have to figure this out now as we go. Where a hundred years ago, our parents or our family or our community would have chosen for us a mate that we would spend the rest of our lives with, and we would have. Well, that's not how it is today. They would have done that somewhere about 14, 15, 16, maybe 17 years of age. Listen to this. At the most intense time in our life sexually, when we create the healthiest babies with the least complications, all of that would have taken place when nature had designed it to take place. But we don't do that now. In fact, we... We wait clear out till almost the end of it to get married and have children. And that's why infertility today is is something like 14, 15, 16%, depending on how old you are, among couples. But we were intended, designed by God, to be married at the most intense part of our human sexuality. But in this culture, that would not be possible. It wouldn't be. And I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying that's how God designed us. And so this is difficult. It's not easy. And uh, when you look at the fact that people that come to America bring all of their different cultures, and then after they're here for one generation, that goes away, and then it's this hodgepodge of trying to make all of this work. And it's about 50-50 as to whether or not it does work. And honestly, that is not our fault. See, I I think that we have beat ourselves up over the fact that somehow 50% of all the people that get married aren't going to stay married. That's really not our fault because there is no longer a template The other thing is the expectations that we have for this relationship are absolutely unachievable. They're not. Nor will they ever be. God at the foundation of the universe did not design for me a soulmate to meet every conceivable need, hope, and ambition that I might ever have. That is not how it is. You're going to find somebody and marry them, and you're going to work at this if it lasts the rest of your life. The rest of your life. I'm 66 years old. I've been married 48 years, and there are things that I can say now that I used to couldn't say. This isn't easy. It hasn't been easy for me and for joy. And and. In spite of that, we have made this work, not because we're great people, honestly, because there were times we didn't have other options. I hope that doesn't disappoint you. Seriously. We just didn't have anywhere else to go. And and if you can make it through those times until you can work it out, then that's good. Whatever reason that you need, hang on to that reason. Hang on to that reason. There's a story that we've been studying, and it's about Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 12. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, their son, by his brother, and all their possessions, and they gathered them up, and they took them to Hebron. 
and Hebron became their land and the land of Canaan. Now, I want you to see some things here. First of all, God called both of these people. He calls them together. He made them a promise together, both of them. God blessed them, both of them, together. Another thing that I want you to see is that they suffered, made mistakes, screwed up, did things they shouldn't have together. Together they did this. It was Hagar who suggested to Abraham that he should have a son or a child by her handmaiden Sarah. Now that seems so odd and so strange to us today. But listen, the fundamental responsibility of a wife at this time was to bear an heir, more specifically a son. That was her sole duty, and Sarah couldn't do that or hadn't done that, and it was perceived that she was being punished by God or that Abraham was being punished by God because this wasn't happening in their life. So she felt this enormous pressure to make this happen. So she was thinking of her husband. She was thinking of her husband. Abraham, he too makes big mistakes. He Really and truly, he offers his wife to a group of traders who he assumes will take her to Pharaoh and make her a part of his harem. And sometimes I wonder if he maybe wasn't a little too eager to do that because he had not yet had a child by his wife. I don't know that. I'm just saying that. But their conflict was conflict that they shared together. They messed up together. They suffered the consequences of it together. They were each other's connection in life. They were. And when they were blessed by God, they were blessed as a couple. They were given a son as a couple. They were prosperous. They became rich. In fact, they inherited a, an entire land as a couple. They were blessed. And their son became a nation. They were blessed as a couple. So I think that God wants to bless us as couples in spite of the fact that we do so much often to mess that up. Here's where I think the teachings about marriage come from, particularly in, in the New Testament. And Jesus gives us this teaching, and then Paul elaborates on this teaching, but it's in the broad category of loving other people as you love yourself. So I am to love my wife the same way I love myself. And in Ephesians chapter 5, this is what Paul says. Husbands, go all out to love your wife exactly as Christ loves the church. So, so you see, Christ is constantly making this comparison between his relationship to the church and his relationship to his bride. See, that connection, that these two become one in the relationship. And they loved, and they marked this by giving. Not by getting, but by giving to each other. So, so you see, here's what Paul says. He says, do this exactly as Christ did it, and, and this is marked by the fact that you give to the other person instead of constantly seeking to give. Christ's love makes the church complete. So you see, as, as I do this in a relationship, and my wife does this back to me, it makes our relationship whole. His words evoke the beauty, her beauty. Everything he does, everything he says is designed to bring out the best of her, creating an image with astounding beauty where she is beaming with the holiness of God. He's talking about me seeing this person, loving this person, speaking of this person in such a way 
that, that she's beautiful, that she believes that she's beautiful. This is how husbands ought to love their wives. This is an investment that pays great rewards. So here's what Paul says. When you invest in her in that way, he said you're really investing in yourself because it pays huge dividends. Huge dividends. Since you were really just one in marriage, he says, does anybody abuse their own body? Does he not feed himself, pamper himself? That's how Christ treats the church. Since he does that, then we too should do that. This means that fathers and mothers, that each of these should cherish each other. No longer two people, but they become one, one flesh. This is a mystery I can't pretend that I understand, nor can I. And this provides a picture to each husband as to how he is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, each to honor one another. Now, I want to be very simple and, and really very quick here. First of all, your heart will follow your behavior. In other words, if you will do something long enough and often enough, then inside you will fall in love with whatever that is. If you show enough affection, if you show enough attention, if you give that person enough, if you work for them enough, in time, your heart will go there. And here's some things that I want you to do, just as very practical things. First of all, every day, encourage each other verbally. It makes me so sad when I hear husbands and wives who constantly put each other down. Constantly. And, and you know, sometimes, I, I know myself, I, I find it easier to be, to be curt and sharp with my wife than I do anybody else. And I love her the most. So, so why would I do that? Why would I speak down to her? Why would I speak mean to her? Why would I speak rough to her? I don't do that to anybody else. So why, so why would I do that to her? There was a philosopher. His name was Machiavelli. And he wrote about bureaucracy. He wrote about leadership. He wrote about authority and administration. And one of the things that he said, he said, those whom we fear in their presence, we despise in their absence. Now, what if we turn that around? Those who we enjoy being around, we cherish when they're not. Make, make your spouse the priority of encouragement in your life. And when they do wrong, when they mess up, you encourage them anyway. You, you become a retreat. Let your home, let your presence be a place where they can run to and, and know that you're going to love them and embrace them just like a mother does, a father does their child. I am here to encourage you and love you and make you feel that you can get up and try again and be successful. Another thing is to be kind. To be kind. I, I know there have been times in my life that, I, I mean, it was like the last person I was kind to were the people that I love most. Kind to them, to answer them softly, to do things for them, to work for them, to serve them. I, I, want, you, I want you to practice being nice to each other, to each other. See, I'm just being as practical as I know how to be 
in, in showing love each other as you love yourself. I, I want people to be kind to me. I want them to be affectionate to me. I want them, I want them to listen to me. And that's my next point. Listening is not waiting to talk. Listening is not calculating a defense back why you said this. It's listening. Yeah. It's absorbing it. It is also important that you share. And I say, I have to share about seven to ten compliments every day every day to, to make Joy feel that she matters and that she's encouraged. She lives in a tough world. I mean tough. Every day. And, and she doesn't need to come home to, to me fussing at her. About, I need to encourage her. Listen, you did well here. That's okay. That's okay. You, you, you see, you're, you're going to get through this. She needs somebody to say these things to without correcting her, without fixing it, or you should have said this, you should have done. I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you. Sometime, if you hurt, tell them that you hurt. Just give them one at a time, though. Here's one that, that I think is so neglected. You have to have fun with this person. I am convinced that couples that cannot have fun, don't learn to have fun, don't know how to have fun, they don't last. And, and I say this, and you've heard me say this many times, if it was ever once good, it can be good again. Whatever it was that you were doing that was fun before, it can be fun again. My wife and I ordered the game Risk on Amazon because we like to play that. And we're sick of watching Netflix and Hulu, and we thought we would like to play a game. See? Having fun, cooking together, doing dishes together, sailing together. Yeah. Doing fun things. You have to plan them, and you have to create them, and you have to schedule for them. You have to cut everybody else out of your life in order to do them. These, these are just practical things. Develop and share goals together. Develop and share goals together. Shared goals is a powerful thing. We see that in Abraham and Sarah. Honestly, it, it probably kept them together. Shared goals. Both of you working for something out there that you have not yet achieved. There, there is a power in the cohesiveness of that that's just unexplainable. Give each other little gifts often, often. See something in the grocery store? He likes, she likes? Give a gift. Often. Give it often. Serve each other. Now, I say this often. I want to serve, but I don't want to wait on you. Do you know the difference? I want to serve you, but I don't want to wait on you. Serving you is something either you cannot do yourself or you need assistance in doing. Waiting on somebody is when they could do it, they just don't and ask you to. Serve each other. With this I close. December and part of January, my wife was sick with COVID to the point of having pneumonia, having a fever. Before it was over with, she, she broke out with something that looked like the chicken pox on her back. I mean, I mean, it, it was terrible. And, and she's difficult to get to go to the doctor, let alone the hospital. And, 
And there were three days that, honestly, it scared me to death. She just laid there. She just laid there. And, and I, would, I would serve her. I, I, would, I would help her. I would work with her. I would do everything that I knew to do, almost to the point of, of pestering her. But I want to tell you this. Because she needed me. I loved that. I loved that. I loved taking care of her. She could be an independent person. I mean, honestly, she probably could make it on her own pretty easy. I love the feeling, though, of being needed and serving her. Listen, Christ did the same thing for the church. These are just little things that you can do to love each other like you love yourself. Now, if you're watching this morning or if you're sitting here in the auditorium, I want you to think about this most significant relationship that is or will be. And I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. And I want you to ask God to reveal just these little things you can do in your life to make this fun to make this fun. Would you bow your heads, Father? It is you that gave us the gift of each other. And I pray, God, that you will show us and teach us how to do this in such a way that I love joy like I love me, that I protect joy like I protect me. I think about her needs the way that I think about my needs. I invest in her knowing that in the end that is an investment in me. In your name we ask these things. Amen. God bless you. In conclusion this morning, thank you for joining us online. We thank you so much for that. If you have some special need and if you would email me that, if you would call me, if you would text me, I would appreciate that so much. And I promise you that I will pray for you. I will earnestly make you a part of my daily prayer life. And I want you to do that. And you can do that through my email, kendupin at gmail.com. For any reason whatsoever, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Father, in conclusion of our worship this morning, we ask that you will take this, that you will use this, that you will make this something that pleases you. And for all of this, we'll give you praise and glory. Amen.